Hi, folks out there in Buddhist land. Uh, wait a minute. Here. Oh, hi. There I can talk to you better. Hi, folks out there in YouTube land and Buddhist land. It's Brad talking to you again. I just put up an article on my blog uh, about inclusivity in Zen, and I wanted to talk about that a little bit. The basic uh, thrust of the article was that there's a lot of talk these days among Zen folk about how to make Zen practice more inclusive. This is because in Zen centers in America, the population tends to skew more towards white people than anybody else. And so people want to make it uh, more inclusive. You don't want to have people feel like some superficial thing like their race or their gender or their sexual orientation or, or whatever should make them feel excluded from Zen practice. The problem with inclusion in, in terms of Zen is that Zen Buddhism has never been very welcoming and warm and inclusive to begin with. For example, the stereotype of how you got into a Zen monastery in Asia in the past, in China and Japan, Korea, places like that, was that you climbed up this foreboding mountain where there were bears and mountain lions and yetis and bandits aplenty, and I'm not even kidding, I mean, maybe not yetis, but, but people believed in yetis in those days, so this was a concern that they had. But there were real mountain lions and real bears and real robbers. And you'd find the monastery that was up there isolated, and you pound on the door asking, please let me in. And maybe a monk would look out and go, get lost. Uh, and you'd have to sit there for several days, freezing and starving and fending off all the animals and bugs and things, until finally somebody took pity on you and let you in, because you had to prove that you were serious about this practice. It wasn't like this embracing thing, like, come and join us in our practice. It was, it was more like, we're up here doing our thing, leave us alone, and if people were really, really, really serious, they could get in. So inclusivity was not a major concern. That being said, there was a tradition of allowing anybody in, no matter what their social status was, and even though the monasteries tended to be gender specific, there were male monasteries and female monasteries, no matter what caste you were born into, you were allowed to come in. I'm sure there were exceptions, but the general rule of thumb was, was everybody was welcome who could make it in. This was such a big deal in Japanese society uh, that you could actually transcend your status. And Japanese society in ancient times, even a little bit today, but, but very much so in ancient times, was rigidly stratified. I mean, it was like the Indian caste system. The Japanese had their own version of it. And the way you could get out of that was by becoming a monk, a Buddhist monk. But you had to be really serious for the monks to accept you. And this was such a big deal societally that there were punishments, legal punishments, including the death penalty for impersonating a Zen monk. Like if you were or a Buddhist monk of any kind, if you were caught eating meat while dressed as a Buddhist monk, you could get killed for that legally. So, so this was a serious thing. This meant that they were serious about including everybody, but you had to be really a monk. Now, there were also temples, and temples were easier to get into. A temple and a monastery are two different things. A monastery is a self-sustaining place in a remote area that really has to make sure that whoever gets in is going to be serious about doing the things that they're going to do. A uh, temple could be a little bit more welcoming, but even the temples in the Zen sense were like, you come to us, we don't, we don't outreach to you. You come to us and, and we'll let you come in, but we're not going to try to get you, you know? Now, America in the 21st century is a whole different ball game. We're all about inclusivity and our temples are cuddly by comparison. So this idea of inclusivity and tolerance is, I think, a very good thing. It's a very good part of American society, and, and it, it's one of the things that makes me happy to say I'm an American, because America is inclusive. But I am a little concerned that things might go too far. One of the things I learned when I was over in Japan was that not everybody shares this American idea of inclusivity and that Americans often seem to be, to Japanese people, like the most entitled, demanding folks on earth. 
like we're all got something we're like saying we gotta you know gotta have this and we gotta have that and and japanese people just roll their eyes at that and i got used to having people roll their eyes at me for the simple fact of being a vegetarian now being a vegetarian even when I was back in Akron, Ohio, that was something that people were like, oh, let's get you some uh, cheese pizza or something. You know, they're trying to accommodate you. Japanese people won't do that. They're like, here's the food, you know, uh, and and that's what you get. And if you don't like it, that's your problem. Now, a lot of people think that this is because Japanese society demands rigid conformity for its own sake, like rigid conformity is some sort of a value over there. But I don't think that's the case. I think that's a misunderstanding of Japanese society. Japan has always been an isolated island nation with very few resources and a lot of people. So it's important to get along with everybody and not to make a lot of waves and one of the ways you can make waves in a society where everybody's really close together and the resources are scarce is to say I need this and look at me and and they the, the society generally frowns upon that whereas America is very expansive with a lot of resources and and it's considered a positive social value to go look at me look at how different I am look at what I need to have and and we as Americans might do well to learn the other way. I feel like this is an important Buddhist teaching, to learn how to be happy with what you have to be happy with, to quote the title of a King Crimson record from a few years ago. You, the society has whatever resources they have, and they're going to provide you with the things they can provide you with, and if you need to modify those things, then, then you modify them. I don't think that society is inherently bigoted because things are made to a certain standard. It's more because of a history of scarcity, where you didn't have the resources to provide for everybody's little quirks and, and needs, and even if they're legitimate needs, so you had to kind of provide the one thing, and then everybody who couldn't quite use that thing had to figure out how to make it work for them. And that wasn't a big deal. Now, I know that for some people it's easier than others, but I kind of feel like in the Zen sense, if it's not that easy for you to fit into what the majority demands, you have a bit of an advantage. And I always felt like my own background gave me a kind of leg up because I spent 15 years of my life living as an immigrant and a racial minority. Now, I do not claim for anybody who's ready to ah at me that my experience as a white guy in Japan and in Kenya was equivalent to the experience of a racial minority or an immigrant in the United States, because obviously it's not. But I do understand how out of place you can feel in that sense and how weird everything is everything tastes weird and smells weird and everybody stares at you when you walk onto a subway train there's always people going guy kokuchin this guy kokuchin they're all talking about foreigners coming into the country and they think you can't understand it you know and your hair is weird and everybody wants to ask you dumb questions and nobody can pronounce your name i know how that feels i really have a sense of that and and i feel like in my own case this was actually helpful because i got a sense of okay things are not going to be exactly to my liking but I'm going to learn to be okay with that. Like the beeping, I don't know if you can hear that on the microphone, but that beeping right now of somebody's car alarm going off is not okay with me, but that's life. And, and you can make that work. So if you have a little bit of trouble, I think you really it's, it's a Zen advantage uh, to, be, to be the odd person out. Uh, I, I really think this. Most Zen centers and most Buddhist centers of all sorts in America, they're a minority religion, if we can call it a religion, we'll just say religion for shorthand, and their resources are limited. So they've got what they've got, and they're going to have to cater to whoever they think is the majority of the people there. Now, that shouldn't be taken to the point where people feel excluded for racial and gender and whatever else reasons. I understand that. But there's also, uh, you also kind of have to have certain limits. Like there was this article on Lion's Roar recently, which kind of inspired the blog piece that I wrote about this, in which somebody was complaining that they were 
um, well, you know, I, I feel kind of bad for this person, but they're complaining that they're transgendered and that there are certain problems. And I'm going, okay, let's hear what your problems are. And then the problems turn out to be things like uh, this person is wearing tight pants and a fake penis. That's how they describe it in their tight pants. And they're worried about how that's going to be in the Zendo. And I'm kind of like, you know, you don't wear tight pants to a meditation center in the first place. And, and the the fake penis uh, you're just adding to why are you wearing that to go to meditation i don't get it you know I, the the old tradition which maybe i don't know maybe there's some value in bringing back of everybody has a shaved head and everybody wears a black robe you know kind of circumvents all of that so you don't you don't even really know who's male or female around you and and everybody's just just looks the same now we don't generally demand that in our western centers although some of the people in the deshimaru tradition actually do i remember going to this place in montreal where you had to wear black robes if you were going to sit zazen and i picked up a black robe that i swear to god the person who wore it before me probably had not taken a bath or a shower in a year it was really stinky like like phenomenally stinky uh, but but you know it, it made for for a kind of different atmosphere in the place because everybody was dressed exactly the same and we could kind of transcend our need to be seen as individuals and as representatives of a uh, culture and and all of this stuff it's it's we're trying to get beyond that i mean there is a place for that kind of thing and you can have that this kind of discussion in your in your university forum or in twitter and and all sorts of places like that and really in in american society today it feels like there are an, an overabundance of places where you can go to be seen for your individuality and for your representation of a certain culture or race or whatever and that's great you know i don't think there's anything wrong with that but when we come to a zen center what we're trying to do is find something different from that and that's our common ground of of who we really are underneath all of that underneath of our gender and our race and our identity and our personal history and our our personal likes and our personal dislikes you're actually putting yourself in a situation that is deliberately uncomfortable for everybody to a certain degree so that you can find this this other level which if you find it can be incredibly useful because it can it can make you able to go anywhere and deal with anything because you can find that substrata that isn't bothered by all of these marks of individuality and american culture is really really all about emphasizing those marks of individuality and and zen culture is not it's about de-emphasizing those things and and finding something that is is below that and that supports that and makes that possible to happen but is not itself like that now it's going to take time but i think that there will come a time when we will have zen centers which are predominantly african-american or predominantly latino or or what have you i think it's coming I, I see people coming to my center who might one day start centers like that in their communities and and i hope they do it, it took two thousand and some years for white folks to get into zen buddhism or buddhism in general if it takes 200 years for another race to get into it well that's a tenth of the time and honestly i don't think it'll take 200 years i think it might take about 20 years before we start seeing that or maybe less and that's very optimistic and that means we're doing well already so i think it's important to make people feel like they can come to practice if they are serious about practice no matter what their superficial characteristics might be i think that is an important message to convey and i'd like to convey that as well as possible but i don't think we need to fundamentally change the practice to be more accommodating to be more welcoming to be more deliberately inclusive just for the sake of inclusivity itself so there you go that's my pitch about inclusivity if you think i'm a 
MAGA hat wearing, make America great again, build the wall kind of guy after hearing that, well, you can leave a comment below and, and I'll respond to almost every comment that I get. Uh, you can also, if you like this or if you don't like it, you can uh, leave a donation and there are buttons below for how to give that via Patreon and PayPal. Uh, that's how I make my living. That's how I afford this space helmet. Actually, Piruz gave me this space helmet. And that's how I do what I do. Thank you very much for listening. See you later. Bye.